The reason why we're here tonight is to discuss about record labels. So what makes a record label uh, uh, achieve their vision, uh, how they can work with artists, how they can make it work, and how they can run from uh, starting a, a label to actually make it into something that looks like a business or that is sustainable over time. I'm Joseph, I also run a label, and I am co-founder co of Homo Sound. We started Homo Sound uh, six months ago with the idea that we wanted to help people in the music industry share the messages beyond their work. And as a byproduct, pro, uh, byproduct, of, uh, byproduct of that, we wanted also to inspire people who are starting off or are in the middle of the music career. We wanted to help them learn about um, established artist experiences and also how they can do things better, but also get inspired. So tonight we have four panelists. I'm gonna introduce them one to one, and then we're gonna do a, I'm gonna ask them some questions. Some of them come from you. And in the end, we're going to leave time for Q&A. So if you have questions that you think you want to ask at the end, think about them, and then you can have time to do that too. So um, help me welcome our panelists. We have Sam Fassel from Juno Distributor. And um, he's also a music producer, record label owner. He runs Wall Street Records. And uh, he's been involved uh, for a lot of years in the music industry. And he now helps uh, more than 200 record labels uh, to get their music out there in vinyl, and also distribute the music through shops around the world. Help me say thanks. <laughs> and next to Sam, Tasha. Tasha uh, is a multi-skilled, talented person who is, uh, runs a label called Neighborhood. Uh, and she's also a DJ. She started the, the brand Neighborhood 10 years ago as a party, an event platform, and eventually started also a record label in 2016 and just celebrated 10 years of uh, operation with a very successful party at Fold that lasted more than 12 hours, uh, packed <laughs> with Divis One headlining uh, and Freddie K as well. Welcome, Tasha. <laughs> Next, Tasha, Philip from uh, Cultivated Electronics. He is also a producer and DJ under the moniker Sync24. He started the, his own party uh, in early 2000, and eventually his label in 2007. And he focuses on electro, that's what he does. And he has produced a lot of other artists, and also under his own brand, he, he released also a lot of his own music. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> and last but not least, <laughs> Rob from uh, Wall Street Records. He is the co-founder of Wall Street Records together with Sam. He gladly accepted to be with us tonight, and thank you so much for coming. We will ask you a lot of questions about your path as a music producer as well as a record label owner. Thank you. So we're going to talk a bit about the label vision. So when you start off, like, what do you think if you have a plan or you actually start and go with the flow? And Tasha, you started off as, a, as an event platform. And I read on, uh, I think, one of your interviews or one of your social media that you started as a, you wanted to create a platform where artists could uh, express themselves freely without boundaries. Was that your vision to create a, a really a platform for people to be free to express themselves through music? Or you had kind of a strategy and that was, uh, they, they came later? Yeah. Um, yeah, basically, well, with the party, um, it started off actually, it's kind of more techno focused now, but in the beginning, it was just like inviting. I mean, I come from a drum and bass background, so I was still kind of booking drum and bass artists as well. Um, and I kind of just wanted them to come and play whatever they wanted, so they didn't have to be restricted to play what they normally play or you know, to come and try something else if they wanted to, but it just was like, yeah, a place that they could come and express themselves freely, really. And that was kind of the message when I booked them. So I wouldn't like really put too much pressure on them. If they wanted to come and play what they normally play, then, you know, um, that's what they did. So yeah, it wasn't really like too strategic, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of came out, uh, was a, organic, so people were playing this stuff and then you created this kind of community of artists that play for your parties. Yeah, and also I think like as well, because it was like um, like two, just a 200 capacity party pretty much for like 
nearly 10 years. So I did a few different things along the way. But, um, yeah, when I started booking DJs, you're kind of explaining, like, that's what it was about. So they kind of knew what the party was about to begin with. So the, mm -hmm. they could come with that in mind. It wasn't just, like, turning up, like, what's this all about sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. And then, I mean, clearly, like, you've been successful in establishing this platform. Ten years later, you have a, a club which is full of people, and people are raving for 12 hours. Did you ever expect that? Uh, was, there, was that ever in your mind when you started? Um, probably not, but I did, I did have it in my mind that I actually thought, I, if I get to 10 years, then that's a pretty big achievement. And I kind of wanted, that was like a vision that I wanted to get to at least 10 years. Um, and yeah, I managed to sustain the party well enough to get to that point. But um, yeah, I mean, I actually did inquire like um, at some point along the way when the party was sort of doing quite well with some of these artists that I've booked like for the 10 years party, but obviously like for the 200 capacity restriction, it wasn't always like possible, but they were quite open to it because that was something that I felt was like lacking in London, that there wasn't like techno parties that were of that capacity. Um, it was a lot of bigger parties going on. So yeah, the agents were kind of up, up for it, but also they had like partnerships with much bigger clubs. So there wasn't always possible again. So yeah, we kind of made it possible just last weekend. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Congratulations again. Thank you. And Phil, a question to you. You started in a similar way. So you started with a party first and then the label came after. Uh, yeah, I started my night guard nearly 20 years ago now. I was, I was just a little kid, really. I moved to London when I was 19. Uh, I don't know. I just wanted to do a club night. Our first night was really successful, actually. We totally sold out. It was just near here, actually, Fortress Studios, which I don't think is around anymore, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had uh, Mike Dread, Multiplex, like Warp Records kind of people. And um, yeah, we, we went in, we had 700, and f I think the night cost 17.50. We had 750 quid, so we were a grand down to start and we went home with two grand, so whatever the maths are. But there was at that time, I was a little arrogant to be fair when I was that young, cause just you don't really have the knowledge and you just like things start happening and it goes quick. I mean, I don't know, that must be quite a mad thing to happen, you know, just overnight you put one record out and get really popular. But it was a similar thing when I was young that that happened. Uh, things got like, quite popular quite quickly. Um, but then, yeah, I've also experienced the downsides <laughs> of stuff and sort of the time. But yeah, I mean, I don't know, I was I just 1001 bar. I, I DJed there for six years every Sunday. Um, that's sort of where I started. And then we did our night and... I still work now as a sound engineer. It's quite a full-on job, so that kind of took over, sort of partying all weekend and DJing Sundays. It's not really lends itself to having a full-time job. Um, so I had to kind of stop the Sunday parties and stuff. But for me, everything's just a, a real labor of love. So yeah. yeah, which keeps you going. And, and I wonder why sometimes, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know, I like but it. Also Sorry to cut in, but me, me and Phil, we also teamed up and we did a party <laughs> together at Corsica Studios because we kind of sort of on the same vibe in terms of, you know, I've been doing my party, he's been doing his, but we've kind of like on the same level in terms of our way of thinking about doing parties and who we wanted to book and the vibe that we wanted to bring. And it was actually a successful party. It was successful, <laughs> but we spent so much money. And we, of course, were like, it's one of the fullest they've ever seen in the club. But then we, we, we spent so much that we just made nothing back. Yeah. Like, I'm talking like 500 quid. <laughs> um, so when you go through all that stress and all the shit, you're just like, oh. I think if you can make money, I don't know. For the music I like, I don't think it's a very commercially viable sound, personally. Um, but again, I've never been in it for money. Like I say, I've got a good job and I've worked very hard for my sound engineering, so that's I'm fortunate in that sense that I have a career on top of my... So all my music to me is just like a very passionate hobby that's kind of grown into a bit of a career alongside it. Um, but it's just a luxury, you know, but something I've worked hard towards, so, you know, but it is a luxury, I feel. I think for just to my opinion personally, but if you're going to just try and sustain a living out of Electro, unless you're Hell and a Half or DJ Stingray, I'm not really sure how many people, Orcs 88 maybe, 
are earning very sustainable livings out of yeah. that genre. Where you work, yeah. yeah. Personally. Yeah. So sometimes you, you just need to do another, have another wor- stream of income. I think so. I mean, I was even reading an interview like with those guys on Ilian Tapes, Denny. I know you know those guys, but even they were saying the other week that they have to work yeah. to, to pay. Uh, maybe not now. I see he's touring a lot and stuff, but I think like, you know, especially living in a city like London, it's not a cheap place to be. No. London, New York, some of these cities are pricey places to live for rents and stuff. So, you know, and then also to get to a stage with a label or something where you can afford to keep putting the records out, you know, if you're relying on the income from the record that you release to get the money back to put the next one out, and let's say your record doesn't sell, then all of a sudden you're, you know, in a in a sticky situation. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna talk about that too a, a lot during the panel. Um, thank you. Uh, question for Rob. Um, so you started West Street Records in 2017, and you've been, uh, you had been playing a lot before that. You've been producing music. What led you to start a label? Um, that's a good question. Uh, basically, we used to chill on Well Street in the pub together. And um, I think it basically just was something that happened quite naturally. I'd always thought about maybe doing a label one day. And then it sort of all kind of slotted into place. I had the idea, formed the idea in my mind, but I I could never have done it on my own. So basically, I've always, um, I've known Sam since school, and we've always uh, done bits together, worked on various projects. And, um, you know, we started talking about it in the pub one day. It just so happened that another guy we went to school with, who's um, the illustrator for the label, he used to drink in there quite a lot as well. And it just sort of like, there was a bit of a eureka moment. It was like, yeah, so I've got a guy who works, you know, Sam just started working at Juno, basically. Um, so it's like, there's a guy who works on the inside. There's, uh, you know, I've got some contacts through uh, that I've made, you know, from my sort of uh, experiences in the industry. We've got the illustrator there. And it just sort of uh, went from there. We sort of had a chat in the pub. And and I was getting sent music as well by um, a lot of young producers. So, yeah, I, you know, I was starting to get bits where I was like, yeah. Kind it of did happen naturally. It was very natural. Yeah. Which is great because it meant that we kind of didn't just say, oh, we should do a label and then try to find a... Or, um, sorry, yeah, or, or, you know, try and find a purpose or a vision. It was already there, and, like, the na- the label was kind of uh, inevitable, <laughs> basically, where we kind of had to do it. Because we, we just started buzzing off certain records, didn't we? And just, like, mm. sending each other links and going, oh, check this out, check that out, and stuff that we felt like uh, hadn't really been fully explored, that maybe had been touched upon, and there were producers still kind of touching upon it, like the odd B-side of something broken beat that's just sort of got a little edge to it that we liked. And yeah, it was just inevitable after that, you know, working in distribution and and everything, yeah. Yeah. It was just the right time to do it. It It's like I was thinking about it for a while, but never, you know, and then, you know, seeing other guys there and chatting, it was like, okay, yeah, well, well, this is actually doable. We definitely never wanted to just do a label for the sake of it and just put out music for the sake of it, because I think there's... Were you planning to produce your own music, to release your own music on the label, or it was uh, just about art, other artists that you had in your network? Both. Both, yeah. Sam mentioned that like there was like a, a period before, we, you know, we all sat down together, and I was I used to say to Sam, like, there was just like B-sides and like little bits and bobs and like people touching on a sound, but not quite um, nailing it, or just be like little one-offs here and there. And it was like, obviously, we're influenced by certain labels, but... And then, you know, it started to form an actual sound. I mean, Sam would chat about it and be like, well, we've got like 30, 40 tracks now that kind of sound this certain way. Actually, the turning point was that um, we did a mix on, uh, we, we did a mix for NTS. And this is before the label, but just before the label. And we, we did it and we put all the tracks, like what we're talking about, into this mix, a two hour mix. And we just listened to it and went, that is the blueprint for the label. Do you remember that? And w- that was it. And we went, right. And we sent that mix to artists. And we're going, oh, can you, can you, feel, you know, do something like this? This is the vibe. And yeah, it just unraveled. The more we looked into it, it just unraveled into this sound. I think we both, the both thing that really interests both of us is, is like breaking new ground. Mm-hmm. I think that's the only thing that really gets me really excited is kind of trying to make a difference and do something that hasn't really been quite done. Exactly. It's like fair to say as well, we come from, like, way back, we come from drum and bass initially, but at the time we were making a lot 4-4, and I think we were, you know, it had been like 
five, six, seven, eight years of making 4-4, four, four, listening to it, being quite in and around that style, yeah. and we needed to get out of it. And fresh, yeah, just yeah. Sound yeah. yeah. <laughs> which which is uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, causes or like uh, reasons why people start a label because they want to release something that uh, they don't see all elsewhere. It should be, it should be. Well, we were kind of inspired, I'd say, by yeah. by for, you know, we just wanted to do it in our own way, take what we were getting inspired by and move it into our own vision, I guess. Yeah, thank you. And Sam, one question for you. The, so you work for a journal distributor, so you had a lot of contacts and, and a lot of context as well and experience with other labels. When you started your own label, how difficult was it for you to actually make that happen? So, sorry, as a, in terms of, uh, as opposed to looking after other people's labels? Yeah, or so when you start a label, like you had to start from somewhere, like a well, logo or distribution set up, uh, getting the tracks, produce them. So yeah, so I feel like um, by the time I got to it, and we had all the vision and the music and everything that you really need to make that happen, by the time I got there, I also had the experience in the mechanics of actually running the labels and what you need to do to actually sell records. So yeah, I had definitely got a lot of experience before we, we started on Well Street, and that definitely made a massive difference to how it, because I think, because we didn't have to worry about those things, because I kind of knew what to do. Um, we had our natural roles that we took like Rob definitely focused more on the A&Ring and I was more in you know the distribution and and, and organizing a lot of the technical stuff um, and it just made it really pleasurable because we never stressed about anything it just unraveled in a really lovely way um, on a really low budget but we've never lost any money on it and and and, and it's it's a really pleasurable thing to work with yeah it really is I have to say No, I think Sam yeah. covered it. It's like, why would I try and get involved in the manufacturing side and the production when he's like, he's working at Juno? I've got people sending me the music. We kind of, uh, like Sam said, we both have a similar idea about the music. So I just it's really important to work with someone who you're on the same wavelength as. Yeah. Uh, like personally, yeah. some people work in their own really well. Yeah. I'm not one of those people. I have to have someone to bounce ideas off. And that person has to be on the same wavelength. Otherwise, you're just going to have a lot of arguments, basically. But because you've known each other for so long, it, it just, um, it, yeah, we just work really well. It's a very good partnership. I think that's important if you're working with someone else to have your distinct roles, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what you do, because that's how a team works, right? Everyone chips in their part and things like that. So, yeah, it's yeah. been a pleasure. It, it, yeah. It, it seems to be working well for you guys. Like, did you split the roles at some point? Or was there a formal decision or it we came We never natural? discussed it. It just <laughs> happened like that. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because we do come together. Like, obviously, he knows everything that's happening in distribution. So, And obviously, we come together when we're choosing the tracks and we're working on, you know, looking at tracks. So we come together on everything, like, on a final decision. But there's no point in both of us, you know, we may as well split the work, essentially. And that makes it more fun. You're less stressed. Yeah. Um, and it just works really well, yeah. Yeah, you work with uh, each in the each person's strengths. Y exactly, that's it, you said it. Yeah, Great, yeah, thank you. Um, Philip, one question for you related to this. The, so you started the label, uh, I read in another interview, with another group of artists, and eventually it became your own, uh, you took yeah, the Yeah, so that. at the time, well, I think you said 2007, for me, all the labels, so I signed my first record to Touching Bass in like 2002, 2003, Andrea Parker's label. At the end, my favorite era of electro is uh, like late 90s to early 2000s. At the end of that, all the labels that I really like, like Satamar, Touching Bass, Scuzzy AV, all these labels were just stopping. Uh, and at the same time, I was sort of sending stuff to ex people and then not getting people not wanting to put my tracks out. So I was like, cool, I think I should do it myself. And I knew all my mates writing tunes, but I didn't really have the money to do it. So I did go to like a group of friends, like my close friends, and each of the people chipped in money uh, to get the first two records off the ground. Uh, and that's kind of how I launched the label. <laughs> But yeah, but then what happened out of that was like most of the people, like the understanding that I set up with the people that I was putting the tracks out was that it wasn't about like necessarily the running of the label. It was more, do you want to be involved in a project where you're going to get your track out? I'll take care of it all. And then as it fell by the wayside and the money was lost. But back then for me, just getting distribution alone was very, very difficult. It's interesting to hear you guys doing it as a duo. 
it's interesting what you guys say about the sound because it's a question that I get asked a lot and the sounds just kind of evolved even now if I listen to like number one to number 10 to 20 to 30 it just I look at my label like this like it's just a very narrow bandwidth is basically what I DJ and that's the sound that I'm into and mm -hmm. that's just what I've stuck to yeah. it just has you know, I'm, I feel unfortunate that my label is quite respected in the, the genre that it does now, and uh -huh. that's what it does, and it does it well. And yeah. I don't want to, you know, it's like there's a record from No Moon that came out last year on Craigie Knows, and it was a wicked, wicked record, man. And it was just all break beats and stuff. And like he kept saying, Do you want to put the record out? And in my head, I'm like, I do, but. I would play the record, but I knew that it just wasn't the C sound, even though I'm like, I was very torn because I really liked the songs, but then I just was like, I'm not going to do it. And then subsequently I watch it come out. It's number one on all the charts and you know the record's selling well, but, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah. not, yeah, not the vibe. So, so it's, it's a, it's a matter of like respecting your own vision and believing that what, what you do is what what connects you to that thing and you want to push it yeah i just i mean it's hard to say i just i don't know yeah well it's just the sound that i like i don't know it's just a certain very linear sound that that i don't know that i think if i if i wouldn't dj it then i wouldn't put it out mm. but then yeah. at the same time i'm a little bit like there's certain tracks i do put out by certain artists that i wouldn't play mm -hmm. but at the same time i appreciate that people that like my label will respect it and it yeah. falls within the spectrum right. so there is a little bit of leeway in that sense yeah. you know like i put a versa life record out last year and i I don't really DJ any of the tracks because they're all a little more mellow for what I play. Mm -hmm. But then I know people like that sound and it is still a kind of C sound. Yeah. It's just not necessarily something that I would particularly play in a set. Yeah. So it's I don't think any hard and fast rules of it. Yeah, it's very interesting you say that because I think it's also a matter of finding what your audience likes and find probably an intersection with what you really love and what they love. But that's probably where you want to focus on as a label or... Putting yeah, I mean, again, for me, it's just, it was, I've never really done it for, I've never really said done it for myself, but I've never really done it for others. I've just, it's, I've not really thought about it like that. It's just, like you guys say, it's just been quite a natural thing, mm -hmm. you know, but it is nice to play a set and, you know, 90% of the tracks, that's the thing. I, I started playing uh, on USBs a few years back and that's just what I really thrive on now is I just play tracks no one's got. I just have so many records ahead now that are like a year, two years ahead that I can just play all this stuff and then by the time I'm sort of done with it, then they come out and it's, I don't know, I find that for me is like quite a buzz. Yeah. And also being a bit older now and having all the tracks from the 90s, you've got kids now that are younger, all that's like new. So you can have, a, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I've, I've, I sound a bit of a tart like that, but sometimes it's like I don't want to play. If there's a new record out... I'd rather not play the new record because I'm like, play, well, yeah. just because I'm like, well, I've got 10 that are like this. <laughs> so I'd rather play the ones that are like it. Yeah. I don't know. I was chatting with someone the other day who was into drum and bass and they were saying that's a bit more of a like dub plate kind of mentality of like having, I don't know, the like... Exclusive uh, yeah, nobody just, else has. Yeah, yeah. So, but then that's what I think the same thing is about having the set. I just try and, you know, to not sound cheesy, but sort of feel like what you've got is something special that's within the sound and maybe if it's stuff that isn't out it's a you know forward thinking people not sure what it is i don't know Gives just you an edge as a yeah just keeping Definitely. fresh like for yourself you know that i get a buzz out of that like yeah it makes sense because you're putting out something which is fresh and then people people is new as well yeah yeah and but then maybe not fresh because maybe the robin and, and sam you run the label together like did you have any moments of disagreement where you were like, no, this thing is like, we just can't get an agreement on this? Only very minor things that ultimately don't really matter. Yeah. I think on the big things, we've always agreed, haven't we? Because we just, yeah, it's really nice, actually. Because you don't always get that with people, do you? But um, it's Because we've known each other so long, I think we just respect each other as well. Yeah. Like, I respect his opinion and yeah, vice versa. Yeah. He wouldn't, I trust him, he wouldn't say anything or like disagree, you know, if he is going to disagree with me, it's going to be founded in something. It's not going to be out of spite or, you know, anything yeah, like that. Yeah, there's none of that silliness. And um, even though at times we're all a bit like brothers, we've known each other that long. Um, yeah, there's nothing like that. And it, um, and I would say that 
Yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to get there. Oh, no, I'll give that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, Tasha, so you, um, for, for people who are starting off uh, with a label and they, they think they don't have enough friends that can help them, they don't have enough money to run a label or, or start a party, like, do you have any advice for, for people like, in that situation? Well, well, they have to sort of question why they want to do the label. Because, um, I don't know, yeah, I had to save up a lot of money to get my record label started. Like, I, it was not something that was just like, yeah, oh, I'm just going to do it for the sake of it. And it's something actually I wanted to do quite early on when I was doing the party because I had a lot of friends around me. In fact, like, you probably know as well, like, the Plastic People times, that's where I started doing the party. Like, it was just an amazing time. Like, there was a lot Such of, a like, plan. new sounds, like, coming up. Like, people from all different genres, like, making new stuff. And it was, like, yeah, you had had all these friends around me that were, like, making music that and playing at the parties, but they weren't getting the music out there. So I just had, like, yeah, all these, like, dub plates, like, um, as Phil was saying. Like, that is kind of the culture I come from as well. But it was, like, it wasn't getting out. But then I kind of, like, took my time with it with doing the label I don't know why but I just sort of maybe it was a confidence thing as well like um and then yeah like um basically yeah I had to do a lot of research speak to a lot of other friends who had labels like lots of di and again in different genres different and everyone did run their labels differently as well so it was quite interesting to you know get their sort of point of views on it like um but also there was like an element of like being naive with it as well because i didn't think too much about it so say like when phil was saying about the distributor i kind of knew like about rubber dub and i knew that that was the distributor that i wanted to distribute my records because i thought it was the perfect distributor for the sound that i wanted to release you know so i kind of just went to them when like well I had the first release ready and I was just like I want you to distribute my records and um actually the process was quite easy yeah. um I had a few friends that were like did you not even have I didn't even have to send them like an audio file of the tracks I just I kind of was really strong about my vision and they said well we can't give you a P&D but we'll do distribution so I think because I didn't have like too much like in the know about it i just sort of went for what i wanted and just like you know i didn't have too much doubts about it but that was sort of built up over years of getting to know about you know running label and as, as i say like not doing it for the sake of it but it was kind of yeah all based from the party really mm -hmm. it grew up like organically within your yeah. community and ambition so i don't know like i think my advice to people would just be like you know Go, yeah, if you're going out to like nights and stuff and you're like, you know, to check out DJs and you're meeting people there with like minds and you're sort of meeting new producers and stuff like that, then um, yeah, just kind of like build your own thing, like start your own party or whatever and build up what it is that you're, you know, you want to put out there that you don't think is out there enough or whatever at yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely agree. I think that sometimes it's also a matter of confidence. Like it takes time for people to build their confidence to say, okay, I'm going to expose myself and put tracks out there. And what if uh, RA writes a bad review or like a weird review about my, my new record? Or what if people don't care, don't like it? I think it takes, you need to make that jump in a way. Yeah. Trust yourself. Yeah, I mean, and also I think it's something like more recently, like, you know, when I'm I essentially just wanted to put out records to begin with because that was what I enjoyed doing was collecting records. And I just kind of thought as well, like, I'll just put the records out and if people are feeling it, then, you know, wicked. But there's all the other stuff as well of, like, you know, putting it out in, like, the press or whatever so that people know that there's a release coming out or there's some information about it. And I kind of, like, did that all myself as well through the contacts from doing events and sort of finding the right people to like do you want to write about this release coming out or do you want to review it but even with that I didn't know exactly what I was doing in the beginning but that is kind of important but uh, I really like this sort of DIY thing from working in a record shop as well where people will come in with like a stack of their records that they'd like done themselves like will you sell my record like and they were only distributing it themselves by going into shops and literally building relationships with record shops themselves. They didn't have a distributor 
and I really like that sort of vibe as well. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's loads of... <laughs> you were probably collecting records before the internet as well. Yeah. So that was kind of the way yeah, it used yeah. to go down, wasn't it? Yeah, totally. And that was the thing as well with the parties. Like we didn't like when I first started doing parties was well a long time ago at uni, like two thousand three. Like, um, but even when I first started doing them in London, like you, you didn't really rely on the internet at all. It was all like flyering and word of mouth and going out to raves and telling people about your parties and building it through that community you're involved with already. So, yeah, like I think I come from a bit of a different background now to what maybe some young people now would just think everything's on the internet. But I think it's all about having a strategy that also works for you with marketing. You know, not there's not one size fits all at all. Um, you could do stuff that's totally wrong and would put people off that might work really well for another label. Talking about vinyl, you and I were discussing about this before the, the panel. Like, how important is the role of the distributor in this process? Essentially, they are the ones that <coughs> get the music to the shops and get well, the shops to listen to the music. Yeah, I mean, there's like what, what Tasha said, you can, it's still possible to do that. You mm. can still press a record and go around all the shops yourself. There are people that still do that and they do really well out of it. Yeah, Tasha, you want to say something? Or? You know, I, I, I think it's just a, ca a case of like what you prefer. As Phil said as well, like with the P&D, the benefits is, is that you can kind of, yeah, be like putting out a lot more releases more quickly because obviously, you, can, you, you know, that the cash you have to front a lot it's not it's not cheap to put out like 400 records or whatever you kind of and as i said like i when i wanted to do it i had to sort of do various different jobs like to save up some money just to kind of make sure that i yeah and wasn't waiting for the money to come back to put out the next release because that takes time as well so um yeah so it, it is kind of down to like your take your taste and like there's a record label, um, Live Jam, well, and Relative, like they're run by John Swing and EMG. And he was someone who I took a lot of like influence from because he was one of the one of the many guys that were coming into the record shop like when I worked there. And as I said, he built up a lot of relationships and his brother was in Berlin. But like they, they managed to build it up like, and their le record label was really successful. And, but it was kind of like for those that, new and like it kind of built like very naturally like that and now they do use a distributor but I like the way that it kind of like they built it up and it got to that point so yeah there's different yeah. ways of doing it um, yeah so there's definitely an element of like creating your own community finding your community where it's like through your own connections your own experience bringing records into shops uh, and eventually you need to find your audience and, and get the music to, to I them. used to like, I'm really, really deeply into my production and I spend hours on my mixing and my sound design and all my stuff. And even now, I used to love the sound of the record, but now like the round off of the edges that I EQ in and stuff, I just prefer even digital. the sound of digital now. Yeah, I've gone completely the other way. But I respect records. People like records. It's good to have a tangible object to have in your hand. That's fair. It was interesting just what we were saying then about the promo because... I've got mixed opinions on that because I think there's a lot I've, I've in the last two, three years, I've used a lot of promo. Mm. I've now got a new deal with a company where I give them all my publishing. And so everything I put out has got promo because it's in their benefit yep. for them to get radio yep. plays, to try and get sync rights, all this stuff to generate more income off the records because you're not going to make a lot of money really off. Yep. I also choose that the mastering that I use is a really expensive engineer who I've used for years and years and his fees have gone up and up, but it's a very integral part in the sound of my label now is mm -hmm. using that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. The, some of the luxuries that come in are just, I think, with anything, when you put the time and the hours in, more stuff begins to open up. You know, you've built your fan base, your sound's established, all of this stuff. Kind of minefield to balance. It might work, it might not work for uh, every label, every release. Uh. Yeah, so I don't know. But interestingly, I've, I've got my CE main label and I've started another label called CE Limited. And... That's a hand stamp white label only. The main reason for starting that was just the overspill of the two labels. I can only really put out a record every eight weeks or so. And even that kind of pushes the boundaries of like affecting your sales. Mm -hmm. So in order to get more music out, I was like, how do I do it? So I spoke with my distributor clone and we were like, look, I want to start a hand stamp white label. Sounds a bit cliche, but it's like, I can't just start Cultivate Electronics Mark II 
because what's the point? So I need to give it something different. So it's a vinyl only hand stamp mm -hmm. white label, which weirdly costs more money than, than doing, doing the full artwork because wow. you have to pay for the stamps. Someone has to physically <laughs> stamp all the work. So it looks more <laughs> retro, but it's more. But the whole thing with that was we're going to not promote that one. Yeah. And then everyone, bang, sells out. Not wow. even a not even a chat. It's just they they go on pre sales, 300, 400, 500 each time. So, so zero promotional all is just through the distributor with uh, selecting and sending to the right shops. Well, I mean, I, I mean, for my opinion, the distributors. So I, I sort of touched on earlier. I, I I went with Rubber Dub for eight releases. After the eight releases, I, I went back to Clone. I had a record at the time from some artists called Morphology who were like. At the time, I don't know when this was, seven, eight years ago, their kind of sound was really popular. Um, so I went back to Clone and I said, look, I've got this new morphology record. These guys are really hot. Would you consider taking me back on? And they were like, yeah, you know, the last one sold. I said, can I have a P&D? They're like, no, mm. like we won't, but we'll put the record out. And actually, weirdly, they put out the morphology one. This is another maybe interesting fact about losing money. They put out the morphology <laughs> record. Good learnings. <laughs> so they put out the morphology record. That sold really well. At the time, it was the best seller for my label. I think I did like five, 600 copies. But subs and then so from there we had a new plan that I then started. I, this is my point actually, which I didn't mean to say, but it ties into the hype. So then number eleven to fourteen, I started a thing called CE Limited, which was limited run vinyl, not not vinyl only, but just limited run records, single mm. press. Because I was like, how do I make some kind of hype around the label where I'm gonna get the sales up? And then that did it by putting limited tag on the end, people go, oh shit, look, yeah. better buy the Scousy. record. Yeah. And then <laughs> cut round to 20 records later, I start another one called C Limited, the white labels, that shit just goes. Yeah. I do think hype is, uh, you know, it's just, it's a thing that has to be, you don't want to be a sellout and you don't want to overpush it, but I think it's a tool that has to be navigated because my labels, like uh, Kudos has definitely risen since I started using promo companies because I wasn't even getting on websites. Yeah. You can bang the doors down and upload them to the sites and no one's no one even responds. Yeah. They're probably overcrowded. The the the, the point that we, we are seeing all all of us is basically the market is saturated. There is so many labels that are putting out music, so many artists. Uh, so it I guess compared to five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, there's definitely much more music around. So then probably press and uh, premiere channels um publications they all get a lot of inbound requests that's why i touch back on the things like sync and all publishing mm. which is a bit of a head fuck but that's where you can as an artist make a shit ton more money yeah because now so it's, and yeah. but no one wants to do it everyone like this new deal that i've got with a company called epm who want to take care of all my sync i go to every artist and they're like oh no that's just a headache and i'm like well okay but look if you just say yes they're gonna t they're gonna try and get it on CSI Miami or this or that, yeah. and if you sign up to these certain publication sites, you call like collection sites, you can you know get five grand, ten grand. Like you never know if you get your song used on one commercial. You know I got yeah, my mate on one many years back, and he got like five grand just payout for a thirty second little ad. Do thing. you have a pub? Do you have a separate publishing deal with it? Uh, well, I've only literally just sorted this out now. So I'm doing all of my publishing with EPM. But then what I'm now offering all of my artists who want to take part is a kickback with the label to say that I will, if you sign your publishing to EPM, from the music that I release for you, I will take X percentage and then you guys get percentage. But then it's down to EPM to yeah. exploit the music. And then subsequently in return for that, I get very good deals on my promotion. Yeah. So in my opinion, promotion, yeah, you know, I'll go all the way with that because rather than now having the luxury of having to, having the non-luxury of having to pay all that money for the promotion, now I get the promotion because it's in their interest that the radio plays it because that gets them money, then it gets the artist money and everyone, it's a win, win, win. But so many people don't want to take that route because it's quite complex in terms yeah. of licensing and all this kind of stuff. And as uh, we were saying before, it might not work for everyone. So you might find, uh, you might invest a thousand pounds, uh, 500 pounds, and then you don't get nothing out of it. Yep. And but publishing is different. I mean, you can sign up to MCPS for a hundred pounds. 
Yeah. You can license your tracks. So if you get your tracks played by, you know, even to go back to the level of like you want to push it grassroots and just send your records to X people, you know, I've had multiple tracks played by Hell and a Half, DJ Stingray on Radio One. I've had five hundred, a thousand pounds from that. Yeah, from the because you get, teacher. you know, I've been fortunate enough to play on Radio One a couple of times myself. I've purposely played all my own music because I know I'm going to get the money <laughs> back <laughs> off it. I did the same. But why not? Yeah. Works. So <laughs> it's just navigate in the yeah. system. And Rob, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go, yeah. mate. Then you stick them on it. And also, I mean, I'm lazy with my girlfriend's brother. He works for PRS. And he's like, if you can be bothered, he's like, every time you DJ, like every, yeah, every, every, every club in the world has to pay licensing rights. Right. So if you just go online and say, I played all of these songs that were mine. On my catalog. Yeah, because the point is the clubs have to pay or the clubs or the, the shops or wherever, they have to put this money in a pot. And if no one collects it, it's dead money. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, like, when I first started, like, yeah, well, I was doing it myself, like, just writing to, like, yeah, publications and stuff, like, to see if they were interested in the music and writing about it. There were, there were some that I kind of built some good relationships with, and I don't know if it's just down to me and my personal kind of, like, view on things, but there was somewhere, like... Yeah, built the relationships because they were like genuinely interested in music and had a lot more of their own things to say about it, like as well as just like putting up my press release. Whereas like there was others where it was more of this like yeah, just add it to the content pile, and I was less kind of up for them do like pr yeah promoting it. Which I, I don't know. I've kind of learnt a bit more since then that it's kind of it's you know it, all, all exposure is good, I guess. But um, that kind of was something that was really important for me. That I just didn't want people just to be sort of just slinging it out for the sake of it. But obviously, like, as the release is going on, we want to get it more exposed for the artists, essentially. Like, um, you know, you want them to have as much exposure so people go and buy their music and then they kind of focus on them as, their, as artists in their own right as well. And, like, yeah, help them kind of get more focus in terms of get them getting more gigs and all the rest of it. So... Yeah, it was a bit of um, yeah, that kind of feeling when I first started doing it. Yeah, I got it. And as we are going to toward the wrap up, I want to leave time for the Q&A. Uh, a few more questions. Now, we touch upon money, and uh, it's a struggle. Like, running an independent label uh, has very, very low margin. Uh, you end up, like, putting a lot of music out, a lot of work. It costs money to produce vinyls. Uh, it costs money, pr perhaps, to promote it. And the revenue is very little from music sales. Are there other ways, uh, we, talk, we talked about sync, for instance, uh, are there other ways that a label can make it, uh, uh, well, let's say, make some money that can help them run and produce more records? Perhaps ba parties, Bandcamp? Or? Bandcamp, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a winner sure. these days, yeah. You've got yeah. should really be on Bandcamp. It's a nice little stream of income coming in that can just help pay for little things like artwork and things like that. You know, you just have to be really careful with your money, I think, because there's not much coming in. But actually, we found that if you're careful with it, what does come in, there's always money there for anything we want to do. We, we've never invested any money, and we've never lost any money, and we've never taken home any money ourselves. But but there's, al there's always enough funds for if we want to do a remix, or we want to pay for a flyer, or we want to pay for something like that. Um, and, I, and that's just basically, it's just totally self-sufficient. So I think if you can at least, if you can, I think an achievement with a record label is getting it self-sufficient these days. If you're, uh, you know, you, unless you're doing really, really high numbers and like with streams, you're talking hundreds of thousands. With vinyl, you're talking a thousand units, something like that. Then you might start making some money that you can actually, you know, say is real money. But until they're that, I would just put it all in a pot and just account, do your accounting very quickly. You know, we'd like, we, we'd do a 50-50 split with the royalties rather than investing. Um, that's not, you know, the thing you've got to consider. Um, so yeah, it's about being very careful, counting the pennies and making them work for you. Yeah, w yeah. W where is it worth for a label to put money? Like, uh, for sure you need to take care of the production. You need to pay the engineer who mastered the tracks. We don't pay any of that actually. We we'd have a P and D deal. So and I through the P and D deal, I do the mastering as well. It covers everything. Hmm. So we don't really invest anything like that. If you can get, I mean, like it's not easy to get on a P and D deal. Uh, we were lucky, um, but I would say, yeah, it, you know, maybe you can, maybe after you've you've pressed your own first record, then you might be able to. Then then you're in a better position to then get on a P and D. I'd say, but if but um, and that definitely does save a lot of money. 
and I wouldn't do any sort of, I wouldn't try and cut corners with certain things like mastering. You know, you really, it's the most important thing, it's the music, and you want to make sure that that sounds absolutely fantastic. Otherwise, the rest of it means nothing anyway. Um, we were lucky, we have really good, uh, we've had some great mastering. We've had Ed DMX, who mastered a lot of them. We've had um, Radioactive Man master a few as well, um, who you probably know. And yeah, um, he does all mine. Yeah. He, he, oh, oh, do you use curved? Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. Does very, mine, very yeah. good. Very good. Keith is amazing and does a really good job. Um, and it's really, yeah, we, we can afford to do all that. So, you know, a good engineer will take a shit track, a shitly produced track, and make it sound good. They'll take a great produced track and just put the magic on it. So it's definitely worth investing in the mastering. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I do, I do really rate Keith because. And actually, that's like one of the most exciting parts of the process with the records um, is going and attending the cut. Um, and he basically will just like show me a lot of different options of like, and and he also thinks about like as well what he thinks the artist like you know wh what they want to how they want it to sound and what things they want to be like boosted or you know from yeah he I don't know it, he's very good at like analyzing it and kind of making the best out of it and I've not got any complaints about m any of my releases with mm -hmm. uh, him mastering. Keith is really good. Yeah. We all like we a lot of our clients use Keith, and they all really have. We get a lot of requests for him, so yeah, yeah. So that's a, definitely something you should not say, man. Very important. Yeah, you're making music. Yeah, that makes sense. And last couple of questions about working with artists. Um, what is a good demo etiquette? So for someone who wants to send you music, uh, what is a good way to approach you? Is it like sending an email, a demo, Rob? I've got an opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> I get sent quite a lot of demos, and I always, if someone sent me a SoundCloud playlist, because it's nice and easy, I can't stand Google Drive, it does my nutting. Having to like right click, and then it sends me onto another page, and then for some reason it's just, it's just long. I know that sounds really crazy, but it is. If it's on a SoundCloud list, I can go boom, I can listen to it. Next one comes on, boom, I don't have to do nothing. So it just makes it a lot. So straight away, I'm already in a better mood when I'm listening to it. Yeah. So that's <laughs> kind of worth thinking about. Um, but yeah, I would say SoundCloud playlist and just like a nice, just a real small email, just something like short and sweet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I actually get quite a lot of demos now. And there's, there's the, there is a difference. Like so you can tell the emails that, like <laughs> so, sorry yeah. to you like line, budding producers line. but like you can tell like when they've just churned out that same email to like x y and z label they don't give a shit they just want to get their record out and they don't care who you are and that kind of like is really off-putting like um because you just like and and they haven't even really they don't even know what the sound is on the label don't know what the label is about and i think just taking a little bit of time just to kind of like you know you can you can tell the difference when they really like know what your label's about and they've like sent you tunes that kind of the sounds kind of close or like you know w with thought of the label. Um, but obviously, like don't just make tunes just to try and fit labels either, obviously, because that's not going to work. Um, but yeah, and don't send like too many tracks as well at once because that's a little bit like too much and like kind of. Um, can be a bit overwhelming as well yeah. so everything else is probably going to be quite hard work yeah. um and i've been really fortunate to like work with people like so far that are kind of pretty laid back about things so um i mean i'm five things i've i've only ever probably taken one track that's been sent to me everything mm. i've ever released i've approached the people and that's uh -huh. how i'm with everything with new artists that i like i go to I'm just constantly listening for what I feel fits the breadth. So I probably get like maybe 10, 15 demos a week for CE, but I can only think of two, three tracks out of yeah hundreds now that I've actually came out the demo. And actually the demo, I knew the guy anyway. So I don't know, I'm a little different. I don't know, I find it it's, it's a slightly sad situation in some respects. I do still believe, if, and I've, I've actually had a test on this recently where... If the artist isn't established, it's very, very risky for me to put the record out. Um, and I had a, a record a while back, um, about six, six releases ago, and it's from a friend of mine. And I put it out uh, thinking that CE was at a level now that it doesn't really matter what I released, that the records would sell. 
and they didn't sell, even though I like the songs. So I don't know. I'm not trying to sound negative. I'm just saying it, it can also be, for my to try and put a positive spin on advice on that, being maybe a little bit savvy about like what you do put out unless you are in a very positive scenario where your label is respected and you you've got a vibe that maybe that sound is something that gets released but i really have felt and I, even when i advise mates of mine who are starting labels i'm like maybe it could be beneficial for you if you've got an unknown artist or something that you get a remix from someone who's a little more established because it can be fickle, and especially in the early days, if if you're gonna invest a grand in a record, and you put it out and you sell 50 copies, and then the distributor sends you your 250 back, you're never gonna get rid of those records. Yeah. So I don't know. I think just 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 my experiences is, you know, putting out established names. If you can get in with those kind of people, mm -hmm. they do sell good yeah. copies. So. It's a balancing act, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, how do you come? How do you find new music? You go and uh, you ask your own network to. Well, I mean, I, for for myself personally, now I've been right. I mean, I've been doing this an awful long time, and I I know an awful lot of people who I I respect. So I'm just constantly in contact with the guys who I work with. You know, I have a, a good repertoire on the label now of people. Plus, through my club night as well. So, like with Tasha saying, it's another in. Um, but there are, I do put out some newer artists. Um, like the last one was these guys, Animistic Beliefs. Um, but again, like they're, they're, again, it's just with them being sl slightly savvy about like how their hype again, coming back to the hype, their hype's massive. They sold shit like they sold more records than established people on the label. And then when I see like, you know, to not want to sound like old here, but you know, like I do find I'm nearly 40 now myself. I find people in the early 20s are way more up on Instagram and stuff like because they've grown up with that thing. When I then look at the stats against all my other artists who are more in my age bracket, against them on Spotify, when they're just so on social media, the streams is like I go through my streams list and it's like this and the spike. spike. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. So again, it's yeah. like kind of navigating, you know, I hate to say it, but when people do have that hype around them and they're so on social media, they're so on this, yeah. which they create themselves. And that, that did in this instance translate to vinyl sales. You know, they yeah. sold a lot of records really quickly. Yeah, yes. picking up, yeah, Sam. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say that's, that, yeah, that's definitely true for a lot of people. And I think that's something that we wanted to go against the grain a little bit. So we 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 actually talked about this before it happened, but we we obviously any artist that is sort of released before we asked them to to make an alias just for us. So every release, the first two or three were completely unknown artists on an unknown label, yet they all sold out, um, sold pretty well. And so what we did is we tried to make it more about the label rather than the artist. Mm. So you know, like for instance, we just made up like names of old football players and stuff and, and things like that and just put it on, sold out. Hard works take loads, you know. <laughs> yeah, like so things like that. But that was very much an intentional uh, thing that we, we tried to do and actually I think that's a bit of a gamble. Not many people would get away with that. I think we're quite lucky. Do you feel that's once you've established your sound that you've done no, that? that was first release. So that was the first one. First release wow. we had over we 200 pre-orders. We started like that. Oh, wow. yeah. oh, just good. It's a bit unknown like, artist, unknown label and we, we've got like 200 pre-orders on the first one. Well, so what you said that's though, good tracks. <laughs> Yeah, what you said it was, it was actually. Yeah, what you said is totally valid though. About yeah, like yeah. getting someone on the remix, perhaps, or like yeah, I mean, there's no wrong or right way to do it, is there? It's like what works for you and your yeah, sound. It's and your just it's unfortunate when I have taken risks, I lose money, you know. And it's even now when I see it, you know, it's just it, in. It, I'm not like excuse my ignorance, but I'm not sure what what style of music you guys release. But for electro that I do, it's just I don't know, man. It's just. It's never been a very popular genre, and I just think it's true for most if, labels. If you risk it, I've just my experience. You know, you risk it, and it just doesn't work. I mean, so. we, as a, if you're talking about getting a distribution deal like a P and D, distributors will not look at you unless you have an established artist. They won't even yep. look at you because it, because it, it's such a gamble with the money for them. They're not willing to throw their money away. I mean, you have to convince them that that, that you're going to sell minimum three hundred units consistently well, well we'll see i see like those lobster theremin i know jimmy and i know that they take a lot of risks it seems 
Actually, I think he does a lot of um, distro only, non P and D stuff. Because I've had, because I've also know, had people come I, to me and say that when the records don't sell, that same deal. Like I had this with Rubber Dub, where they're like, we're sending all your records back. So then, well, that's when you own the records. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you own the stock, that will happen. Um, I mean, getting a distro deal like that is actually quite easy. Anyone can really get a distribution deal if you pay for your own records. It's the the, the production and distribution, the P and D deal. It's very difficult to get on and very sort of you can see we've really made that we've taken that and run with it and made it work um but not everyone will get that opportunity um so it is hard it is hard yeah i mean i yeah as i say I sort of fifth release that's when they were like okay we'll do a P and D because yeah. I've, I've kind of proved that i can sell enough records for them like to put them to front the costs mm. yeah and also choosing your established artists as well i mean something that I see a lot is labels, they, they think they get an artist and because they're getting lots of DJ gigs all over the place, they think that's going to mean that they're going to sell loads of records. That's not always the case. Um, and vice versa, someone could be selling really good records, but they never get any gigs. Um, it's not always the case. Sometimes, you know, mostly it goes hand in hand. But It's definitely just, a hype machine, though. It's, it's definitely yeah. not a, a given that you're going to sell a lot of records just because you're DJing a lot. And labels will go, oh, yeah, he's really big and we can do this. And they'll say, oh, yeah, we definitely sell it. But actually, you look at their sales history and you're thinking, it's not that great. Not always. So you do have to always take the advice of your distributor, I yeah. would say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, let's leave some time for q and I propose that you shoot over the question and I might repeat it on the microphone. So we are, yeah. So this question was... Uh, Number of copies you should be doing if you do a vinyl release. Should you do 100, 200, 300 or more? You're actually very limited with that because most factories now will press minimum 500 units, which, which you're very, un yeah, minimum. So unless you're ordering 500 units, you're actually unlikely to even, no factory will probably take your order. There are more, there are more factories that have opened up now. I'm talking more about the more established ones. Um, it used to be 300, and some will still do 300. You're very lucky if you find one that will do 200, but there are the, there, they do exist. You pay a bit over the odds for it. Because like anything in manufacturing, the more you press, the more the cost gets swallowed up with the quantity. Um, for a new label, you for a new label, you want to press as le least as amount as possible, because you want to sell out. Like he was saying, earlier, it looks good to sell out quickly. Um, just gives you a good look. I mean, we was I think we yeah. We made sure we sold out the first few records. That was really, really important to the point where you can almost take them offline if, if you, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. We never did that, but I'm just saying I've seen it. You happen. can, yeah. Um, so yeah, what you're saying, just you well, just think that is basically. I mean, you might just get left with a lot of copies at the end of it, and you probably will have to take a hit. Um, that that is hard. Or just look for those factories. Yeah. Since the last That's five wrong. years, more factories have popped up now, um, especially in Europe. So you get these smaller factories and they're much more desperate for work. They're not desperate, but they're, you know, they'll take on the smaller jobs. <laughs> if, you, if you're passionate about uh, selling records and selling vinyl, then what choice do you have? You have to work with what you've got. I don't see any other way around it. Maybe you could look at the fact that maybe uh, selling vinyl isn't, you know, you could do other things, like maybe you could do a couple of digital releases to gain a bit of momentum to then launch a, a vinyl. Or, you know, again, it goes back to this whole thing of it's, it's a very unique thing to your situation and, um, and your goals. Like, what do you want to achieve? Like, what would be a success for you? Yeah. You know, is it selling 300 vinyl? Is it getting your name around? Is it getting gigs? Is that your ultimate goal? I but think I that's important think to, to work out. If you, like you said, I don't have Bandcamp, but if you do do Bandcamp, your margins, my margins are nothing, but like I said, I, I, it's not something I particularly look for financial gain. So what I get for the pressing manufacture cost against my distributor return is very low, but I have friends who sell on Bandcamp. So if let's say it costs 350 euros to manufacture the record and you can sell it for 10 euros online, that's your money. So even then your margins get lower because you need to sell less to get the money back may be an option. But I agree with you. I've I've always, apart from that one instance I said with the 200, I've always pressed 300 minimum records. And for the first 10 releases, they may be sold too. Yeah, yeah. And then, but now in time, they did all sell, but it took years of, you know, taking the hit. The, the, the question, I'm going to repeat it quickly. The question is, uh, so when you're starting from the event side, uh, before even the label, how did you approach venue for the first time? How do you pull up? 
your first part essentially? Um, okay, so yeah, Plastic People was where I just was obsessed with wanting to do a party, but it, I actually did a party with two other people before Neighbourhoods at Plastic People, and we were just going there and stuff, but uh, we did a very different, it was like a multi-genre night actually before, and um, we, but it always had to have like one set of drum and bass, um, and anyway, we just basically like, were just like, right, it has to be at Plastic People, and we just literally just like kept on and on and on. Then we'd go down, we'd always ask to speak to the manager. We'd like, come and have a meeting. One day we were just like banging on the door, literally just like, will you have a meeting with us 10 minutes? Like, just let us tell you what we want to do. So we were literally like very, very persistent. And like, they basically said, okay, you've got one night and that's it, like your trial. If it's, if we don't, cause they were like, we don't really like drum and bass. We don't really need to have you here. And then after the one night, they were like, okay, let's see how this goes. And then it just kind of, like, happened. But I think it was just, like, our real, like, drive and passion and to try and, like, convince... You know, we obviously were quite convincing with what we thought, you know, we wanted to... It was going to bring for people and, like, you know, it was something that they didn't have already in, in general in London. So I think, yeah, just knowing, like, what it is that you're having that drive and passion and, like, that kind of can help basically a lot i think if you turn up and you don't really know what your concept is or like what it is your event is about then it's the the club owner is going to be very like mm, don't know are you are we are you going to make us any money and they will probably just say right well you can come and do it because it's quite it can be quite easy to get like a, a club but also like if it's they don't really believe in you then they're probably going to charge you a lot of money to hire the club and then that's going to be quite difficult for you to sort of sustain. So, so yeah, that's really, really maybe make a start of it as well before you approach a club. Like live it, know your onions. You know, yeah. get a crew of people. It definitely helps. You got to live get it. a crew of people. Yeah. I mean, with parties, the more people you have helping you, the better, basically, because they all bring down a few friends. You know, and when you're booking DJs, like you might think, oh, they're they're really good. You book them for musical reasons, but sometimes you need to think, well. Yeah, you've got to be resourceful. You've you got know, to like if I book this young guy, all his mates are going to come down to, to sort of see him because they're really enthusiastic and he's going to get them all to come down. Someone who's been around a bit might just be like, oh, I've got this little gig around there, you know, don't bother coming. They don't push uh, you the same way. They don't yeah, care you know, about it can be a bit way. like that. So you've just got to be clever, work it, I think. Mm. It, it takes time, most likely it takes yeah. time. Yeah. Other question, yeah. So the, the question is, uh, yeah. did you start with your people you knew, your friends when you first released, or you shoot for... Other I people established with, artists. I, I started with my friends, but they were all semi established artists. So I was in that sort of middle ground. We started with unknowns, but it was someone who had been sending me demos for a while. And I kind of had a dialogue with him about, like, you know, this is what we're looking to do. And he was a guy who, whether he knew it or not, was kind of touching on what we were thinking about. And we just sort of developed it together. I'd be like, you're onto something here, keep going. I think Tasha does the same thing where she's like, she might not be quite on it, but she can see that there's something there and you just kind of keep feeding back to them so everyone we kind of started off but saying that the second release was one of the people that are involved with the label under an alias so we had that to fall back on so here the question is do you take more pride in releasing an artist that is unknown or an established artist. It depends, doesn't it? I would say Phil's already kind of said. I was going to say they're probably <laughs> yeah. going to say the opposite to me, but yeah, basically, yeah. I like getting the good stuff and the people that I'm into. But so. like one thing you did say about the remix um, thing, like yeah, there was like what, with the really compilation on, actually, like the, that, like the, the last release. The um, mm. so well, it was, it was skeptical. Not necessarily um, a big artist, but someone that we were gasping. Like, drum bass producer, and, um, obviously, but um, we'll he started sending me this like techno stuff. He'd been writing, and actually, when it comes down to it, it's cool. And then he also had like the collaboration with Roberto. We'll actually see just like one of the tracks that I was like, yeah, this is really wicked. That's quite different. Some will. There's certain artists. And basically, like I literally got it day before. Record. played it like that last tune and played it fold actually that, of that ilk and it wasn't so um, much about the reaction from the people it was just like more like how it sounded on the system and I was just even like, some what names you'd be surprised um, and I literally like texted him as soon as I come off and I was like really I need to sign that like I just knew it like um and it was great because it was like obviously like he's first kind of thing is this like new alias so that was kind of cool but it wasn't so much about that it was just like how it sounded and it was wicked so but yeah it's cool um that i've managed to release it i guess um 
Oh, it's it's Yelsa is his alias, and it, uh, yeah, the track is with Roberto on um, the co last compilation. Yeah. Great. One more question. Here we go. Um, say for young producers and people who are just starting to release music, do you think they should agree to any offer that comes in, or should be more selective? Yeah, should should young producers be selective about where they release, or should they just release it anywhere? Definitely be selective. Yeah, yeah hundred percent. You could have a really good, uh, you could have some really great music, and you could put it out on the wrong label, and no one will ever hear it. And you could put that on a different label, and you could do really well out of it. I think you should have, although you can't obviously choose where your music gets released. Um, you know, labels that you admire, and obviously. If, if free labels come in and you, you've never heard of them or when you do hear of them, you're listening to their music and it ain't really quite what you believe in or part of your ethos, then w what's the point in doing that just to get your music out? Is that what you want? You want, to, you want it to mean something, me personally anyway. There's lots of people that release music now and it just getting something out doesn't mean anything really anymore. You can self-release these days quite f for free on the internet. I mean, so yeah, definitely the label is really important. Um, you're joining a you're joining a, like a club or a team or something and that that helps you as part of your elevation and your development and and totally everything everyone who in, in music industry is a lot about who you mix with your contacts who you know so you really need to start building those up in the right way the right people for you who are going to develop your career yeah. i would say and not necessarily should be like a, a huge label or a super established label you can find a small label uh, someone who just started that is the right fit for you I think also respects your time. Like for me, I don't have a lot of time. So if someone wants to track from me, it's going to take me uh, as much as I've tried over the years to speed up my workflow. It just doesn't happen. So it takes me about a week to write a song. So I've been very selective of who I'm going to dedicate. Because also I can never do it in a week straight. So that's taking hours here, hours there. And it's quite a big commitment. Um, so I just think you should, as any producer or artist, like respect what you do, whether you're starting out or 20 years in, you know. So if someone's, you know, a valid point, like if it's a good label, then yeah, do it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So before we, we let you go for drinks, uh, let's uh, say thanks to uh, all of our panelists tonight. Rob. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Philip. Tasha, thank you. Thank you, Sam. And let me also say thanks to Lionel Lamb, who is hosting us tonight. Thank you. Yeah. And, and just a few, few more thanks, and then we'll we let you go for real. The and Inverted Audio, who did our ticketing and also helped us uh, promote the event online. Thank you. And last ones. The crew, Joe Holton, who is filming the video. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. <laughs> Ricardo for uh, doing the audio recording. Woo! <laughs> Vlad, who is our editor. <laughs> hey. Flaminia, who is doing pictures with her, her new iPhone. Uh, <laughs> it's probably better than my camera, so <laughs> great. <laughs> And uh, Alessandro for organizing the event. Yay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.